these uh, diagrams and the discussion, most, uh, some of these diagrams and this discussion about what we're dis this talking about this morning are all in those pages 59 through 89. So if you want to go back and refer to them, develop your own approach to them, apply them to IWT in your own way, you can do that. Plus, this entire PowerPoint presentation will be up on the IWT site. I presume it's password protected or whatever, but uh, we're working it out with Frank and others. So that, um, and it doesn't have our name on it. It says IWT, as you know. And uh, that's the way we like it. We give this stuff away. Um, so you can take this, and if you need to modify it or want it, you have translated it to Korean or, you know, <laughs> Spanish or whatever works best for you to help you do your work. That's what we want to do. When we left off, we were talking about people like Bartimaeus and the leper who um, had nothing to lose. Nothing to lose, everything to gain. We were talking about the Pharisees who thought, who thought they had everything to lose and nothing to gain. Now, why do we know that? It's not just a general portrait of the Pharisees. <clears throat> Remember the famous saying in Matthew by the head of the council? When they were in this big discussion about Jesus, he said, you're absolutely right, we've got to do something about this. If we let this man continue, the Romans will come, they knew or they were proposing that if let Jesus go on, there would be this mass turning of people to Jesus. The Romans would perceive it as a political move. And so he said to the rest of the council, if we let him keep on going, they, the Romans, will come, away, come and take away both our privileges and it may be the end of the nation. So they had a lot to lose, at least they thought they did, okay? How do people come into the kingdom? Well, these are two wonderful case histories, Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 50, and John, uh, these three passages. Now, we mentioned Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus does not appear just once. He's most famous, he's most famous for coming to Jesus at night, right? That's what we were talking about the last session. That's the passage, John 3, uh, 1 through 18. What happens in the second passage? What does he do? He spoke to the council on Jesus' behalf. And what was the council's reaction? An You're an idiot. Go study the scripture. Obviously, you don't understand. In other words, we always try <laughs> to stifle a dissenting point of view by denigrating the person. Now, he was a peer. He was among his peers. But what we see here is a huge psychological, emotional, and spiritual shift. He has gone from complete fear, coming at night, he's now come to a place where he's willing to actually raise the subject and actually speak on behalf of Jesus among his peers. He's willing to take the risk. The first time he was willing to take no risk. He was trying to disguise what he was doing. He appears a third time. What does he do the third time? He joins another guy, and they do something together. Go ahead, Andrew. Do you like that? Are you talking about the, there's this body in his burial? Exactly. He goes out with this rich businessman. Ha! Here's this Pharisee. 
takes up with this rich businessman, and together they go, they go to Pilate and say, can we have his body? And Pilate said, you mean the guy's dead already? Sure. <laughs> so Joseph of Arimathea, the rich business guy, and Nicodemus together go out to the cross, get the body down off the cross, probably had to get the soldiers to help them because they can't get, you know, he's hanging up there. And they put Jesus into the tomb. We know this was a tomb which Joseph of Arimathea owned. No one had ever been buried there before. That tells us very clearly in the story. So first time he comes full of fear, afraid of his peer group. Second time, privately with the peer group, he argues on behalf of Jesus. Third time, he goes public. What do you make of this? Process. Okay. Information. If you are an Indian woman living in the mountains of Peru, and in the mountains of Peru, uh, you have already had six children, and three of them have died within 18 months of birth because of gastrointestinal disease. Uh, you are a person who knows they have a problem, and now you have, now you have a nine-month-old child, which is your seventh birth, and maybe your fourth child. And now the kid is sick. And you've seen this happen three other times. Now, in your village, the traditional answer is go to the witch doctor, right? The traditional faith healer. That's what your mother, what your grandmother did. That's what the elders of the community authorize and recommend. The only problem is that in the Quechua language, you have been listening on the radio, the provincial capital radio station has this program in Quechua on ch child health and health programs for mothers. And you started listening, you heard these programs over a year ago that talked about how you can save your child's life, who's dying because of amoebic dysentery, because of diarrhea, dehydration, all of this, you can save your child's life through a very, very simple technique called ORT. You know what ORT? Come on. Oral rehydration therapy. The reason the kids die is dehydration. Combination of boiled water, sugar, and salt. That's all. More children will die in the next 60 minutes of GI tract, dysentery, than all other diseases combined. And it can be solved with ORT, which is low cost, simple solution. <clears throat> She's been hearing these programs on the radio. Two months ago, there was actually an animator, a government health an animator, who came into the village, set up these charts, showed and demonstrated what could be done, and so forth. Now she's thinking about this. Does she want this child to die? No, she wants the child to live. Her, now she's faced with two alternatives. One alternative is do the traditional thing. That's what the social context uh, reinforces. It's like the Pharisees reinforcing Nicodemus' point of, point of view, right? They had a certain traditional pattern of thinking. But she's now considering the possibility of a radically different alternative. But she knows that if she adopts this innovation, remember the curve? If she adopts the innovation, she is undertaking certain risks. What are the risks? What are some of the risks? Social rejection. Social rejection. By whom? 
family, peers, maybe the elders of the village. She gets the witch doctor mad at her. That's not a good thing. <laughs> so now she's in a terrific dilemma. She finally decides that her grandmother, not her mother, but her grandmother, who's old and who's seen everything, but she feels really loves her, her grandmother is the only person she can even privately talk to about this. So she talks to her grandmother, and her grandmother says, I don't understand these things. I don't know how this works. But I think it's good to try to help babies live. And if you want to try it, I'm willing to stand behind you. Now suddenly, this mother, who is having her seventh birth, suddenly has an ally. Now, she had information. She thought about it. She started hearing about this. I mean, she's had now six childbirths before. She'd been thinking about the problem for a long time. She's been through a lot of stuff. And then a year ago, she heard about this possible solution, which seemed so remote possibility. She thought about it. Then the guy came to the village, and he presented. He, she actually saw it happen. She watched him do it. She went back and listened to more programs, went back through the cycle, week after week, because he's been gone now for two months. Every week she's listening to these programs, thinking about his presentation, thinking about the fact that she's got this nine-month-old kid, and sure that he's going to get sick. And, you know, bingo, two months after the guy's in the village, the kid is sick. She's got information, she's thought about it, it's been reinforced through different channels of communication. So we have radio, now we have live presentation, discussion with her peers. Suddenly, the child is sick. Now we have the big M word, motivation. If you do an analysis of the 22 to 23 people that came to Jesus, every single one of them came to Jesus with a problem that they could not solve. Nothing ever happens spiritually until somebody is motivated. Information alone never, never, never does it. There are so many pressures. There are so many factors. Satan, the cares of this world, the affairs of life, Pressure of peer groups keep us, tradition, keeps us going in the same direction. It's only when we're willing to consider alternative options. Now, I think we constantly have to be praying that God will intervene in people's lives. I have a member of my family, a very close member in our family, who knows God but who does not live for God. There have been times in my prayers for this person I've prayed specifically. This is a terrible prayer. Oh God, do whatever you have to do in this person's life to bring her to yourself. That's frightening because we know there can be some pretty bad things that happen to people. Motivation, conviction. She's got the dying child She has become increasingly suspicious about the old way and re increasingly convinced that she ought to at least try the new way. She makes a decision. She talks to her grandmother. She has one ally. She makes the decision. She takes the action. The kid's life is saved. And she is a believer. Now, the other story that's up here at the top of this, this, chapter, this Luke chapter 8 story is the story of the guy who ran the synagogue 
in Jesus' hometown. Well, not Nazareth, you know, he had adopted. What was his adopted hometown? Capernaum. Capernaum. It was Peter's hometown and Jesus' adopted hometown. And the guy who ran the synagogue was a guy by the name of Jairus. Okay, now Jairus, you remember in Mark chapter 1, Mark opens up with a story. The first chapter of Mark is, <laughs> I like Mark because he's like a journalist. You know, he just jumps into the story. There's no preamble. He just jumps in. And the first chapter is like 45 or 50 verses. About 20 things happen in the very first chapter. It's just the stream of consciousness of all this stuff that happens. Bing, 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 bing. You know? And one of the things that happens in the very first chapter is Jesus has started his ministry and he's standing up in the synagogue and he's reading the book of Isaiah. He is in the middle of reading the book of Isaiah. Jairus is sitting on the front row. He's the guy who runs the synagogue, but because of Jesus' status as a Jew and as a teacher, he had the right to stand up and do this. He was doing this and in the middle of reading the book, this crazy guy shows up. He comes in the back door. Screaming. He's nuts. Bona fide, genuine, real deal, crazy. Everybody in the room turns around and looks at this guy. And they say, oh, it's Charlie again. He's the town crazy. He's 35 years old and he's nuts. Everybody in town knows him. They know his parents, they know his brothers and sisters, they know that his parents have done everything they can to try to save this guy. They spent money, they've done the, the, the herbal treatment, they've done the prayers and the oblations, you know, they've done the whole, you know, maybe they did the spiritual retreat thing. I mean, they've done whatever they can to try to save this guy. He's crazy. It turns out he's demon possessed. And like a lot of these people we see in the New Testament, the demons, not the guy, the demons look at Jesus and say to Jesus, don't, do not speak. Well, <laughs> Jesus is not put off by this, like this guy, you know, the Gadarene demoniac. They put this guy in chains. I mean, that's a pretty scary guy. You know, he, Jesus walks right up to this guy. Well, here's this crazy guy comes in into the synagogue, Jairus is sitting there, and Jesus casts these demons out. And the guy is, for the first time, in the memory of everyone in the audience, first time, they've never seen him in his right mind, and they have never seen anyone like this changed in an instant. They knew something really, really big had happened. These are ordinary people. These are fishermen. These are accountants. These are tradesmen. These are housewives sitting in the audience. They looked at this and they said, whoa, whoa. Now the reason we know, absolutely know, this is the case because the very next verse says, because of what happened, the fame about Jesus spread like wildfire throughout the entire region about. People don't spread the word like wildfire unless they think something really, really big deal has happened. Now here's Jairus sitting there. This is the opening chapter. Now, <clears throat> fast forward the tape. Go along for two, two and a half years. Jesus comes and goes, Jairus has heard all the stories, the calf, in the cafe, you know, campfires around you know, the lake, talking to his parishioners. He knows now that Jesus is on the outside. The guy's up in Jerusalem. Jairus is connected. Jairus is part of the establishment. Nothing to gain, everything to lose. But because Jesus is a local guy and because he, this tradition, Jewish tradition, Jairus has had to tolerate, he's had to put up with Jesus. Now in this story, what happens? 
Jairus has had information. He's had two, two and a half years of information. Before Jesus ever showed up, Jairus had a lifetime of religious teaching. Jairus was on a journey, friends. He had thought about it. When Jesus burst onto the scene, suddenly his whole worldview was kind of challenged. New information against old information. He had time to think about it. Jesus would go out of town for a week, two weeks at a time, come back. You know, Jairus kept hearing, getting feedback. Re re he would think about it. reinforcement. He talked to people in town. Stories would begin to circulate, come back into Capernaum from other places where Jesus had been. People are coming back from the dead. People are being healed. These amazing things are happening. You know, this was not fiction. It was not fantasy. He was hearing this stuff. And yet he was desperately clinging to a traditional perspective. And he was looking, friends, don't feel, you know, if you, if you think about the people in Cape Town, the people in Seoul, Korea, the people in Malaga, you wonder why in the world don't they turn to Jesus? This guy was looking at Jesus in the eye. He was watching this stuff happen, and still his heart was hard. I mean, for a person whose heart is hard or who are resistant, there is no intellectual argument that will bring them into the kingdom. What happens to this guy? Something happens in his family. What is it? He's got a 12-year-old daughter who got, becomes desperately ill. Now let me ask you. We find out later that you know, he, he goes to Jesus. Let me ask you, do you think when the girl got sick, do you think Jairus went to Jesus first? What did he do? Went to the doctors. Prayed. Gave sacrificial offerings, oblations, chants, prayer and fasting. It was a Jewish tradition, you know, Jews did fasting. We know that's true because it turns out that when he finally turns to Jesus, we know on the clock it is 11.59.59. The lights are just about to go out. He doesn't even know it. He's on the street. He's on the street in the center of Capernaum, and in his house, his wife and their friends are there watching the child. And during the time he's down on the street trying to find Jesus, the girl dies. So he did not even think about Jesus until she was really, really bad shape. The problem is Jesus is out of town. He's on the road. And he's going, Jairus is going out of his mind because he's tried all this other stuff. Now stop and think about this. Think about the Quechua Indian woman, witch doctor versus oral rehydration therapy. Jairus is thinking about Jerusalem and the establishment versus his daughter being made whole. In business terms, we call this cost-benefits analysis. What Jairus did before Jesus ever came back to town, Jairus had made the following decision. He had made the decision that he was prepared to risk his relationship, his livelihood, his professional standing, his relationship with the establishment in Jerusalem in order to save his daughter. She was worth more than his professional standing. Jairus knew the guys in Jerusalem were out to kill Jesus. They had already stated it. It was very clear. So he's down in town. He had heard that Jesus may be coming back that morning. 
He's downtown on the main street, and Jesus, the boat pulls up at the edge of the lake. Jesus and the disciples get out of the boat, and they're walking up Main Street. Jairus, who is the main religious man in town, in the, think of this, African tradition, Asian tradition, here's religious leader in the community, has a very special position in the eyes of all the people. People know, people are smart, they know that the establishment is very unhappy about Jesus, but the people love Jesus. You know, he's a folk hero. They're not quite sure who he is, but he is something else. But they know there's huge tension. So now the crowd, it's Main Street, it's in the middle of the day. And Jairus, in a traditional Eastern culture, here comes this prophet walking up the street, this teacher, Jairus, the main man in town, religious man in town, falls on his knees in the middle of the street in front of Jesus. Basically said, <laughs> I'm willing to give up everything. Will you please come? <laughs> I've thought about that so many times. I thought, you know, if I had been Jesus, I would have said, hey, Jairus, where you been for the last two and a half years? I got a real problem with these guys up in Jerusalem. I can get a little help. I need help. You know, a little quid pro quo, you do this, I'll do this. Can we make a deal here? Nothing. Not absolutely nothing. Isn't that the fabulous thing about God? No strings attached. If you're willing to trust me, I'm willing to come. Just like the leper, you know. What do you mean, do I want to? Of course I want to. So he said, let's get going. So Jesus hasn't even unpacked. You know, he's still walking up from the boat. So they take off her driver's house. They get halfway there. And you know this woman who's had this hemorrhage for 10 years or something. She comes up, touches Jesus. This story, you can imagine Jairus is going crazy, right? You know, you can take care of this woman anytime. She's had this problem for 10 years. We, my, and they leave the woman, and they get halfway to the rest of the, the journey to the house, and the people come down from the house, they forget it. Send them back, it's all over. She's D-E-A-D, -E dead. By this time, the people were chanting the funeral chants, wailing and moaning, and Jesus said, don't even listen to these people. Just keep going. Isn't that fabulous? Oh, <laughs> Can you imagine in your mind the picture? These people milling around, dust, people shouting, wailing, screaming. Here's Jairus, this desperate man who's now risked everything. And Jesus said, Don't listen to these people. Think of the house, Jairus. Is there, the mother is there. Jesus said, get all these people out of here. Take the mother, the father, Jairus, up to where the daughter is. She's raised to life, and it, the story says, and they, Jesus gave the, this is a lovely picture, Jesus gave the daughter back to her parents. And J.B. Phillips in his translation says, and her parents, Jairus, and the mother, were out, this is the actual words, were out of their minds with joy. Now Jairus, you just, you know, this is his story. And everybody that you're trying to reach in the IWT initiative in Malaga or Dayton or, you know, they're there, they're at different places. And we have to be sensitive to that. So this means that everybody's got a part. That's why IWT integrating the pieces in partnership is so key, and that's why what you're thinking and talking about here is so critical. Here's the basic picture, another way to look at this. At the top, well, you know, we talked about these four stages, the antagonist, and you've got the indifferent people, you've got the seekers, and you've got the, the believers, so the disciples. Okay, those are the kind of four broad categories in every city where IWT goes. Now, 
we've got general revelation. God is working. God has been working in Malaga, whether you acknowledge it or know it or not. Because we just don't know the lives of everybody. We don't understand. We don't know what woman has got a hemorrhage. We don't know who's got a dying child. We don't know, we don't know who's got a child that's dying of dysentery. We don't know what's going on. God knows, and God is working in people's hearts. What we have to do is offer them a solution. Pick them up where they are. The moving train we talked about yesterday. So we've got general revelation going on, and down underneath, the whole base for everything we're doing at IWT is prayer and faithfulness. So we have God working at the top, general revelation, drawing all people to himself. Underneath everything we're doing is prayer, God's people praying for us. Now in between, we've got mass media, radio, television, print, distribution of materials, all kind of stuff. We have large, maybe large events, 200, 500, 5,000 people show up in the stadium or whatever we may do. We have interpersonal communication. We have people sharing Christ one-on-one. -on -one. Here's the interesting thing about this. Over the years, there have been thousands of research projects that have done, been done to determine which forms of communication have the greatest impact at what stage in the commitment process. Now, adding the, the third dimension to this is the spiritual process of stone clearing, sowing and watering, reaping and discipling, okay? Now, we believe in this, we acknowledge this, but how do you actually make it work in our IWT strategy? All over the world, since the late 30s, there have been all kinds of studies on how the mass media, say radio, television, newspapers, now the internet, how do these things affect change? Do they introduce change? Uh, do they reflect change? What do they do? One thing is very, very clear about the mass media. Mass media, I don't care if you're trying to get Quechua Indian women to adopt the idea of oral rehydration therapy, or you're trying to get Moroccans to consider Jesus as the source of salvation. It's very clear that the mass media is very good and is best in the early stages. Has greatest impact. Stone clearing, sowing. As you approach this, the reaping stage, the influence or the impact of mass media declines. Now look at this. And by the way, that, oh, it's a fan. You know, I can do without the fan. They, maybe those fans there could work, but I'm trying to figure out what the error was. <laughs> Thank you. Um, interesting thing about the mass media is, and as we think about internet or we think about missionary radio or Christian broadcasting in our area or even mass circulation print, once a person has made a decision, then the mass media is quite good at reinforcing the idea, helping educate you further. So radio is quite good at sewing, stone clearing, sewing, television, and quite good at educating. So if you want to do discipleship, once a person has made the decision, look at this though. All the studies show, all the studies show that if you have a decision which has significant social implications, as you approach the point of decision, interpersonal communications become the single most important thing. So in our IWT strategies, as we try to put together a strategy for a city, mass media is very important, can have a very key role. Uh, large events can have a significant role. But ultimately we have to integrate these pieces allowing them to play the different parts so that we have the kind of outcomes we're looking for. And underneath, of course, all of this is prayer and faithfulness. Um, what this means is, as you see, in the early stages, 
when you're talking about stone blurring and sewing, the, the message, there's no point in giving a person who's antagonistic or even indifferent. There's absolutely no point in giving them the four spiritual laws or the plan of salvation. That's, you know, it, we say in communications, that's a very explicit message, right? In the early stages, we're talking about implicit messages, nature of God, nature of life, the dilemma of life, the problems of life, how God can meet our needs, drawing parallels between the kinds of things they're facing day by day and the, the spiritual journey. So as we move down this process, that's why when Billy Graham, when Billy Graham, here's a classic illustration, I'll tell you a story here, that, that illustrates this. Billy Graham, when he finally gets 10,000 or 100,000 people in the stadium, after two years or a year or something of preparation, and it comes to the very end of the service, he says, God wants to meet you here now. And I want you here, those of you who are prepared to pray this prayer after me, say this. I was in a very fancy apartment building in Washington, D.C. a few years ago. I was introduced during this party to a quite striking woman who I found out was head of the graphics and illustration at the Smithsonian Institution which is our most famous museum in the United States. She was in a very high level position, obviously very bright, um, and I found out from some people that she had recently become a believer. And I guess it's the journalist in me, I'm always interested in how that happens. Why? How? This was her story. She said, I was raised in a home where my parents were indifferent. They were not antagonistic, they were not pro. I had an aunt who loved Jesus and who said to my parents, do you mind if I take her to Sunday school with me? Yeah, it can't hurt. So she said all the way through elementary, primary school and middle school, she said I went to church and Sunday school with my aunt. It was always very special for me because afterwards we would go out for ice cream and lunch and together, it was a lot of fun. I went away after high school, I went away to university. My aunt wrote me every week said she was praying for me. I got my degree, got a master's degree, got married, had an excellent job in my field, very, very uh, enviable position. Came home uh, one day and found that my husband had packed his bags and left. The next week I found that I had been fired. She said, I came home after, to this empty house, empty apartment. My husband was gone. I had no work. She said, I was sitting in the chair at 11 o'clock at night with a glass of whiskey, watching television, just surfing through the channels, click, 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 click. She said, I came to an old Billy Graham crusade. Billy Graham was preaching. She said, I do not know why. She said, I continued, I stayed there, and I watched this. And when he came to the end, <laughs> she said, Billy Graham always does exactly the same thing. He talked to the people in the stadium. Then she said, he turned to the camera, and he looked straight at the camera. He says, you too can know Jesus tonight. Here's what you need to do. He prayed the prayer. I prayed the prayer. My life was changed. Now, you think about this story. Who was the evangelist? Holy Spirit.
both. Okay, so we have the aunt. I've talked to Billy Graham about this stuff. Billy has never in his entire, he preached to more people than any other living human being. Saw hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people turn to the kingdom, both in live events and mass media. Billy never once saw those people came to Christ because of his message. In fact, Billy Graham, the last 10 years before he got really ill, was interviewed every single year. There's a famous guy on CNN, Cable News Network, by the name of Larry King. Some of you may have seen him. And he has he interviews these people for an hour. And usually, it's very sensational, celebrities and people in you know, trouble and stuff. But he loved Billy Graham. And Billy Graham and Ruth Graham loved him. They were great friends. Now, Larry King is a non-practicing liberal Jew. And every year he would have Billy Graham on twice, unlike many of his programs where he has two or three guests. When Billy would come on the program, Billy was there for one hour by himself. We began, my wife and I began seeing these. You'd see it, you know, the television guy that Billy Graham was going to be in Larry King, and we'd turn it on. Just, just watch this amazing exchange. Why is this pagan? Why does he have Billy Graham on his program? 30 million people around the world watching this. There were two questions, two questions. You could always count on it. During the hour, Billy sometime would always ask these two questions. Uh, or, I mean, uh, Larry King would always ask these questions about Billy or of Billy. He would say, Billy, now this is, now he's now already had Billy on six, eight, 10, 12 times. So he's repeating the same question. He said, Billy, I understand from you that if I do not accept Jesus Christ as my personal savior, these are the actual words Larry King uses. If I do not accept Jesus Christ as my personal savior, I'm going to hell. This is on national, international television. And Billy always, always, always responded the same way. He said, Larry, you and I have talked about this many times before. You know I don't say that. And then he pulls out from his lap. You know, he's got this old Bible, and he puts it up on the table. And he says, God says this. I didn't say it. God says this. The second thing which Larry always asked him was, Billy, you know, you preach to more living people than any living human being has ever done. You've had dinner in the White House with every president, you know, since Harry Truman or something, and on and on. You've had these incredible privileges, private audiences with kings and queens, command audience performances, you know, and why in the world? I mean, why don't you just rest on your laurels? Why do you keep doing this? Now, here is the line, friends. Never, ever forget this line. He says, because this is what I'm called to do. It's not because I get a rush. It's not because I see tens of thousands of people come into the kingdom. And that, friends, is the difference between perceived success and faithfulness. Billy is called to a certain kind of thing. So when you ask this woman, who was now this famous graphic designer for the Smithsonian, you say, who was the evangelist? Billy would never, ever claim that this woman came to Christ because of him. He did what he was called to do. And God gave the increase. This is the classic personification of what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So that's what we're trying to do at IWT. There are some people in Malaga that have a lot of knowledge about God. Some people have bad knowledge. In Islamic societies, there are very few people who have good information about Jesus. A lot of people in Islamic societies have bad information. They don't have no information. They have bad information. 
there are some people who are highly motivated. Jairus, right? When his daughter was dying, this guy had to have a solution. And quick. <laughs> There's some people like who? The Pharisees. Negatively motivated. If we let this guy keep on going, the Romans are going to come and take away everything. All our goodies, all our fa fancy clothes, special privileges, good food, good wine. It's all going to be gone. Kaput. Now, where was the thief? Where was you know there were two thieves on the cross, right? Good guy, bad guy. <laughs> good thief, bad thief. <laughs> good cop, bad cop, right? <laughs> the good guy who said, "Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom." <clears throat> Do you think this guy was high in knowledge? He was a Jew. He knew a little bit about you know, tradition and Jewish culture and religion. and He knew enough to know that being in God's presence was important. Did he know who Jesus really was? Eh, not really, but he had some. How about the Pharisees? Did they have high knowledge or low knowledge? High knowledge. How about motivation? The thief on the cross, was he motivated? He, he had minutes. He had minutes, and he knew it. Unlike Jairus' daughter, she didn't know when she was going to die. For the, for the thief on the cross, the end was very clear and very near, and he knew it. Very high motivation. How about the Pharisees? Were they motivated to accept Jesus? No, 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 no. Terrible motivation. So here's how... IWT works. We're trying to come into a city and acknowledge these realities. And we have to acknowledge that down here, the only place you really do, can ever do stone clearing, the only place you need to do stone clearing, is people who have a lousy attitude or bad information. And it's down there that we do the sewing. And eventually, as people begin to move, as their awareness and need rises, we can do watering. Finally, as they are motivated enough and have enough knowledge, then and only then can you do a reaping. And only up here in this upper right-hand side, in that upper right-hand Quarter is the only place in the world that you can see people come to Jesus. They've got to have enough information, they've got to be, in, be motivated enough. And that's why, that's why, you know, Billy Graham's role in the life of the woman was very important. It was critical. The role of the aunt who faithfully presented Jesus was equally important. So that Jesus' saying is true. He who sows and he who reaps will what? Rejoice together. Even in many cases, we don't know about who they are. And, you know, in Cape Town this morning, or tonight, <laughs> tomorrow morning, in Cape Town right now, there are people talking to people about Jesus. Probably dozens of them, maybe hundreds or they're living Jesus, or they're acting like Jesus. In Metro Manila, there are hundreds of people living the life of Jesus, talking about Jesus, demonstrating Jesus. We don't know who they are. We may know a few of them, but we need to honor those people and realize that they're out there. And they're part of our great IWT company. We're trying to draw them in to the IWT process Honor them, give them a place. So we have this great kind of, we're conducting the symphony of all these parts. God is guiding us in this. Uh, just a final thing. We remind you of what we looked at yesterday. Uh, we talked about this process idea. So here you've got these folks that we've talked about. 
And what you are doing is you're trying to build on the work of God. This is not just some theoretical abstract thing. This is the reality right now in Metro Manila, right now in Dayton, Ohio, right now in Cape Town, right now in all these cities. God is at work. We need to, and when we start talking about now the details, because this evening and then tomorrow morning, tomorrow and Thursday, we'll talk about actually the mechanics. How do we, how do we build trust? How do we talk to people? How do we run meetings? How do we do these things? What we're trying to do is not invent witness for God. What we're trying to do is be used by God to integrate existing and new resources so that people can come into the kingdom. Because it is as these pieces come together, Psalm 133, the Holy Spirit is released, God's people are refreshed, and spiritual change occurs. Comments, observations, thoughts? Got 10 minutes. I want to take some time for discussion, questions. Mike, 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 Mike. Mike, Mike. I, 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 just a comment only. I like the way you had pounded us with so much illustration on attitudes at first. You were addressing areas of attitude that for us not to fall into a trap of thinking that we are the one, the Holy Saint one, but looking at the whole collaborative approach of what God is doing already in a nation uh, to put things in perspective. The second part is not forgetting the forerunners uh, that are ahead of us. The third part is not taking the credit. Then you just highlighted again Billy on the last part. And then the fourth one is for us to be open for new things, not remaining in the old school mindset. You mm. have illustrated the mining company. And then you said uh, when facilitation in a nation, in a city, in a suburb, we will always encounter like what you said in Madagascar, that out of the blue, just a person will just suddenly bum blush you not to be on a defensive mode, but affirm and draw out from the people. And number six is the sovereign hand of God throughout history. And you pounded us again on the last part is the process is very important. Just a comment on Thank you. What I, I hope you didn't feel pounded too hard. No, but it's a very good pounding. <laughs> I would say this, that the reason I'm here, the reason Seth is here, because we believe the IWT calling is a calling of God. I wouldn't even be here, friends. I got other things to do. So what I'm saying is God's called you to a critically important role. Never, ever minimize. See, Billy understands that what he's called to is important. It's not trivial. But Billy didn't make what Billy does happen. God made it happen as Billy was obedient. So what you're doing is very, very important. I'm just, you know, exactly. We just need to be aware of what else is going on. Um, as you were sharing some of the stories, I was just wondering, I mean, I had the thought before, but what happened with 9-11 or after 9-11, uh, if someone have ever traced how many people made commitments to Jesus in the months after that, and I won't be surprised, just in the light of what you said, if that was probably the highest in the past 10 years or 20 years in the U.S. that people came to Jesus because suddenly 
the security was shaken. But uh, it was just I well, wondering was, about that. Well, you know, thank you for mentioning that. You know, because it those of us who were interested in the spiritual dimension of what was going on there watched with I watched with enormous I would say because of my kind of analytical side and my spiritual interest with a kind of fascination you know, because nobody no person ever orchestrated this this was spontaneous tens of thousands of churches were filled with people in the days, the three, four, or five days after 9-11, cathedrals, churches and communities were filled with people who never, ever came. Remember that stuff? I mean, it was, it was, you know, humanly, you could say, well, it's a kind of psychological, emotional reaction. Well, why did they go to church? Why didn't they have a big rally in the street? Uh, that's a really interesting point, and I don't know if we could ever go, you know, now in perspective, could go back and try to research that. But that part was very, I don't know how many people actually came to Jesus, no idea, only God knows. But we do know that the most unlikely, in, you know, the Seattle, which is a pagan city, <laughs> there were these big articles in the newspaper, churches filled, you know, Services, I mean, and they were called all kinds of things. Celebration of hope. Come pray for the nation. So you had gay and lesbian front, you know, coming in to pray for the nation. I mean, what is this? Well, it's the thief on the cross. That's what it is. It's the thief on the cross. It's Jairus with a dying daughter. The only problem was the daughter didn't die. And the nails came out on the cross, and the thief got away. So the pain was gone. And we did not, we were not forced to the conclusion of the journey we had started. Other observations? Um, just following up on what you just said, because I, w I kept wondering throughout this time, because we had um, heard many stories about Japanese, you know, they, they hit a point where it's like, oh, I don't, I don't know where my help is going to come from. And so um, they, they have these divine appointments where they meet Christians and, and they become Christians. And, and um, a lot of the Japanese, though, they will leave the church after like maybe between three to four, five years. Because either their problem has been solved, so they don't have, they don't feel like they need anymore, or they it hasn't been solved the way that they were expecting it to be solved, and that's why they feel like it it wasn't worth it. And so my question was like, how do you think, or why why do you think that people are like, or where where is this coming from that people can actually have their nails taken out and and walk free, or the the girl didn't die. Like, is, th is that all basically what Satan is trying to do in order to keep the people away from God? Or have they not really realized what Christianity is all about? Have they been fed the wrong ideas about Christianity? Uh, two observations, Rahel. That was really, really important observation because it's true all over the world. I mean, you have people who, in a moment of desperation, turn to Jesus, and then three years later, they can't be found. They, they can't be found. Um, I have, you know, kind of two thoughts. One is, and I think I feel quite certain about both of these, but one of the amazing things about the gospel and about the nature of God is Satan wants us to always believe you can hold the truth in one hand. It's either it has to be black or it has to be white. And as we read the scripture, we see the scripture is full of paradox. It seems in God's way of doing things. You can never hold the truth in one hand. Always has to be two hands to hold the truth. I think there is a certain absolute validity in what you suggested. That is, people turn 
to Jesus, the Japanese, or the Kichu Indian woman, or Jairus, or whoever. And they get inside. They get a chance to Jesus in a little more detail. And they never are introduced to the real Jesus. And I've talked to some of you personally here. The reason you're doing today what you're doing is because you got inside religion. You actually accepted Jesus. You got inside religion and you got fed up. It was empty and vacuous for you. You had made a decision to follow Jesus. And you're about ready to bail. And maybe in your mind you had already bailed. So I think we do have in the church a responsibility. What is the, what is the real spiritual journey? What is the real Jesus? And I think we see, you mean particularly in the, the, both the Gospels and in the Epistles, and then we see the stories, completely different context in the Old Testament, where these men and women, we see the trajectory of their lives. You know, Job, which is a classic illustration, and some of the prophets who ran naked to the streets and were thrown down in nut, muddy wells, they didn't bail. They kept going. Job said, you can kill me. Hey, <laughs> I'm still going to trust. So we do clearly see in the scripture the idea of finishing well, staying with God, walking with God, growing in Christ. Um, but I think we also have to at times be careful and, you know, Please don't misunderstand what I'm going to say. I think that times we have to be careful about saying this person is a Christian and this not a Christian. They're not spiritual. Uh, and just to make my point, I would ask you, do you think that this woman that Jesus encounters, he's down on the coast, he's preaching, the disciples come to him and they say to Jesus, hey Jesus, there is this woman who is driving us crazy. We're going nuts. She's got this daughter that she says is demon possessed. We can't get rid of her. So they somehow, they gain, you know, get Jesus to stop and talk to this gal. And it's one of these most, I mean, she was an outsider. She was not inside the house of Israel because we have this very clear discussion, right, about who gets the goodies and who doesn't get the goodies. She said, I understand, hey, but I'm satisfied with crumbs, crumbs just falling off the table. Please give me a few scraps. <laughs> and he said, woman, this is amazing faith. Go home. Your daughter's healed. Now, are we going to see the Syrophoenician woman and her daughter in heaven? Are we going to see the leper from Mark chapter 1 in heaven? Are we going to see Jairus in heaven? I'll go out on a limb, I'll give you my answer. I think we will. Because they encountered the real thing. And even though their trust, their understanding was very, very limited. And they may have somehow continued on in more traditional religious context. We don't know if the Syrophoenician woman was religious or not, because she knew Jesus had something that she needed. <laughs> that at some point they put their faith in the one who was the center of the universe. I don't think you can have that encounter with Jesus and be lost. I understand your theology may be different, so I just think, you know, holding the truth in two hands. I think on one hand we have to, as YWAMers or as disciples, we need to encourage people, take them to a level of maturity, understanding the journey with Christ, so they don't three years from now say, hey, it's not really meeting my needs, I'm going to move on. On the other hand, we need to be very careful. People who do or have acknowledged Jesus, 
but may not, may not be living it exactly the same way we are. To just dismiss them. It's part of the great mystery of looking at the backside of the tapestry. See, if I knew the answer to those questions, I'd be running the universe. And that would be really scary. <laughs> One more observation, it's time to quit. Yes, Moses. Um, yeah, I think it's in, in a Korean revival, we, since we had a, a civil war was happened in 1915, and uh, after that, all nation was destroyed, and the people was really desolate, desolate. And then the gospel was how it was important in their life being changed. And this is one of how people, you know, getting to be believers. There was... Yeah, thank you so yeah. much for that observation. Um, Korean people, desperate, looking for answers, and um, Jesus looked pretty good. <laughs> <laughs>